Um, I have to mention that this summer I went to the UK and I went to Birmingham and uh, wasn't really expecting. I mean, of course, I knew Tolkien had been there and I actually went to uh, Mosley Bog, which is apparently a place that he liked to explore. And I went to the um, uh, Sarah Hole Mill. But uh, I also main the main reason I went to Birmingham was to go to the oratory and the Newman Museum there as a sort of a pilgrimage. Um, but I did, uh, among other things, get to visit St. John Henry Newman's library in the oratory, which was amazing. But also in that library, they do in a desk there under the desk, they keep uh, the trunk that Mabel took with her from South Africa to England. And in the desk, they keep some things, uh, mostly some books and cards and pamphlets that belong to the young Tolkien brothers and to Mabel, um, such as a, a book of meditations by Savonarola that uh, Mabel owned and a, a school book, I think a book on Shakespeare that Tolkien had used in uh, high school at King Edwards. And uh, so I got to actually handle some of these books that belong to the Tolkien's, which was quite amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, pe people know about Tolkien uh, being raised by this Oratorian priest. They know about the story about him being forbidden to see Edith uh, for a certain number of years until uh, he uh, became a, a major, if that's the expression, until he stopped being a minor and uh, then them getting married. So people know about Father Francis, but one of my favorite things about this book is that you bring out the more general oratorian influence uh, on Tolkien, and you even profile several priests who were at the oratory and Tolkien would have been uh, likely to encounter during this time. So not to necessarily get into all the individuals, but just to talk generally about what the oratory is like, what its spirituality is, and, and how that would have influenced Tolkien. Yeah, and this is, I think, one of the biggest discoveries, in a sense, from my research um, on Tolkien, looking at his context. Because, yeah, as you said, everybody knows about Father Francis, you know, if they know anything about Tolkien's biography. But they tend to think of him as just an isolated priest and maybe, oh, the Birmingham Oratory, well, that's his church. Right. But the Birmingham Oratory was a whole community, 15 to 20 fathers there at any given time. Um, and it's part of, he's part of this community, um, a very active part of it. Um, and that's something that shaped him and he, he became friends. I mean, for instance, Father Vincent Reed, who's one of the other, um, oratorian fathers became a lifelong friend and visited him as an adult. Um, you know, and, and so we see there's lots of other relationships that he forms. And one of the, one of the aspects of those individual relationships is that he had a lot of mentors. Um, these are men who were well-educated. Many of them had gone to Oxford and Cambridge as Anglicans because they couldn't have at that point in their lives as Catholics. They were people who, who wrote books, who did scholarship. And this meant that he was raised up in an environment that really valued the intellectual life. And that's not a coincidence because it, it connects to oratory and spirituality. Um, so the, it's the congregation of the Oratory of St. Philip Neri, founded in, in Rome um, in the 16th century by Philip Neri, and it brought to Birmingham by John Henry Newman. When Newman, um, he'd become a Catholic, he'd become ordained as a priest and his, his friends with him. He, he thought, well, I want to found a community in, in Birmingham or in, in England. What, what community shall I found? Which one shall it be? And he chooses the congregation of the oratory as being best suited to his gifts and his friends' gifts. And part of it is indeed that the oratory, their charism emphasizes the intellectual life. It encourages um, the fathers to continue in their independent, you know, reading and work. Um, it's not, it's a congregation, not an order. So remember the, the fathers are free to leave at any time. Um, it's, it's a fellowship. Um, it's a voluntary association bound by ties of love and, and community rather than by, by a, you know, an order. And St. Philip then is, is this, is the Holy Father of the oratorian community and his spirituality, um, it's very Eucharistic. Um, that's a key figure. Um, and it also has a couple of really important characteristics. One of them is an emphasis on humility. He's very keen to emphasize humility as a fundamental virtue of the Christian life. Um, and that's a really, it's interesting because he's pairing it with an encouragement of the intellectual life 
and mm-hmm. also an encouragement of artistic gifts because another aspect of oratorian spirituality is a great emphasis on the arts music um, that's a huge part of oratorian spirituality beauty in the liturgy beauty in the vestments so intellectual life beauty art music but also humility so that you don't make those things an end in themselves right. And woven all through that is also humor. Philip was quite a character. Uh, there's loads of stories about how he would use humor to sort of puncture people's, you know, puffed up egos and and deflate his own ego and, and using humor as a way to develop humility. Um, taking the spiritual life seriously by not taking himself too right. seriously. And that is a key, key factor in oratory and spirituality. And when I realized that, it unlocked a lot about Tolkien's own personality and his approach to life. Because Tolkien can be quite silly, and sometimes in ways that is are a bit unexpected when you think. But he's a serious academic. He's a famous author, and yet he would have these like strange, silly shenanigans. But then, if you realize he had been brought up to recognize humor as a way to keep himself humble. It begins to make a lot more sense. 